Hi, everybody. It's so good to be back. And um, we are Jim and Nancy Smith. We've served in the Congo since 1978. But Jim was born there in the 40s. And his parents went out in 1938. So we have 83 years of experience collectively uh, serving the Lord in Congo. As I was sitting here um, thinking about you people and this church and the Brown family who are very near and dear to our hearts, uh, this verse, these verses came to me in Malachi. And I taught this book in Congo. It was a, an incredible blessing to me. And the last chapter is where I'm going to center in, verses 16 and 17, because these verses remind me of this church. And I just wanted to encourage your heart today. Uh, I, don't, I could just about guarantee that there is no other church who supports Laban Ministries who prays more for us than you all do. And you have for years. Uh, only God knows how many things have been worked out through your prayers. Amen. And we want to thank you so much for your faithfulness in praying. Uh, it's, it's moved the hearts of thousands and thousands of people in Congo. Um, so I, as I was sitting there, these verses came to mind. You'll only find this in the Amplified Version, a version that I, I love dearly. Malachi 3.16. Then those who feared the Lord, okay, I should back up to 15 and tell you that Malachi was written 400 years before Christ. It was written in a very, very dark time of Israel. Utter chaos, the priests were evil people, and the, the men who brought their offerings to the Lord were bringing uh, tainted offerings, lambs whose legs were broken, or they were sickly. And so it was in a state, it was, a, it, it was kind of like we are now. Mm -hmm. We're just a mess. Yes. No and way. so uh, the verse preceding the two I want to concentrate, and now we can sit, is verse 15, and now we consider the proud and arrogant to be happy and favored. Does this sound familiar? Yeah. Evildoers are exalted and prosper. Yes, and when they test God, they escape unpunished. Now, here's the beauty of this chapter. There's always a remnant. There are always yeah. those of us who don't go along with the tide. We love Jesus, and we're going to stick with him to the bitter end. And so this is describing you. This is what reminds me of you. Then those who feared the Lord talked often one to another. And the Lord listened and heard it. And a book of remembrance. You know, there's more than one book in heaven. There's the book of life, but there's also a book of remembrance. In this book of remembrance, God says, a book of remembrance was written before him of those who reverence and worshipfully feared the Lord and who thought on his name. How important it is to think on his name and worship him and revere him. And this is what will happen in your book of remembrance. Because you are, we are all writing a book of remembrance. A book of remembrance, I should say, is being written in heaven above all of us. Amen. And they shall be mine. We will be Jesus. We, we will belong to Jesus. We do belong to Jesus. And they shall be mine, says the Lord of hosts. In that day when I publicly recognize and openly declare them um, to be my jewels, my special possession, my peculiar treasure, and I will spare them as a man spares his own son and serves him. So just a little word of encouragement. Every time we meet, every time we praise God, every time we pray, every time we extol him, Every time we set aside to uplift him, that is written down in a book of remembrance. And I challenge the people in the Bible Institute, the men and women who are attending, 
how big is your book going to be? Is it going to be a few pages? Or are you going to have one as big as the Bible? There's no limit to how large your book of remembrance can be. You people have faithfully served. John, you have spearheaded this ministry for decades. That is not lost. That is not wasted. That is remembered and written down. And we have everything to look forward to. And I can't wait to hear about your book of remembrance. I, I'm sure God will share that, right? Because it honors him. Jim asked me to give a little update. Uh, we have several diverse ministries in Congo. When Jim's father was alive, his heart's passion was to start a Bible institute. And so in his short 15-year career there, he opened up 90 villages. Well, that's not an easy feat in Congo. The roads are horrendous. But he, he ministered to these 90 villages and made sure there was some basic teaching there by a man who he selected and others helped him select, who was a spirit-filled man who was interested in promoting the gospel. But his heart's desire was to start a Bible school where men and women could come and learn the scripture in depth. They could teach their own people. And so Jim had that same passion when we went out in 78. Just a few months later, a month later actually, he started a Bible Institute. It's called Laban Bible Institute. And Laban is named after Laban with just a French accent. And uh, we graduated seven men in 1984. And since then over 700 have completed the three-year course, uh, started over 400 churches or took over over 400 churches began uh, that began as prayer cells. We just completed another graduating class this July. And uh, faithful men who've left their homes, sometimes we, we have women who come from nearby. It's a big price to pay, but they come for three years. They get a break at Christmas and Easter and summer, and uh, that, that took place on July 10th. Uh, we have a small um, dispensary that saves people from malaria and basic diseases that are not too complicated to handle. We have the best midwife in the county. She's wonderful Marvina and Elise, two of them actually who deliver more babies than any other little clinic around us. Um, we have a women's literacy school that was begun in 2004, where women who s have slipped through the cracks of education just uh, weren't, they didn't fit in, or their parents couldn't afford to keep them going to school, or they just never learned. They fell through the cracks of learning how to read. And so we opened the school to teach them God's word. That's their main text. The first thing they read besides their little phonetic books and phrases and counting and writing their name is God's word. And it's, it's just made such a difference in their lives. Can you imagine mothers having your children bring notes home from school and you don't know how to read them? You have to ask your child to read the note to you. There's a lot of shame and a lot of um, just horrible, heavy depression and ignorance that comes without knowing if you don't know how to read. And so that has been lifted. The women have been given dignity through the word of God and the simple act of reading that we all take for granted. Uh, we're big on evangelism in our Bible school. We're gearing up for another out, uh, thrust, outreach. And um, the pastors are deciding where they're going to go, how long they're going to stay. But I guarantee you there will be some women from the literacy school who will insist on going because John, we've translated the 
Evangelism Explosion Program into Kituba, and our professors have translated it into French. And they have learned, that's part of the course for the Women's Literacy School, as well as the Bible Institute, to learn that course and go hut to hut. And uh, then each person who makes a profession of faith, uh, the Jesus film is very big in our evangelism outreaches. Each person is, who raises their hand is given a white slip. And they hold that white slip up to, to signify that, to acknowledge that they want to learn more about accepting Christ. They're dealt with in a group, and then they are dealt with privately by an individual worker who tries to make sure they understand what they're doing. Uh, the evangelism is a highlight and a, a, the heart of the Bible Institute training. We also have a radio ministry that uh, started in 2004. We took uh, three 10-foot sections of antenna, radio equipment, uh, speakers, microphones, cassette tapes, that really dates us, uh, <laughs> to Congo. And we are in the process of revamping that whole thing. The, the, the 18,000 watt generator, diesel gener generator, uh, Lister, has had it, and it's on its last leg. So we have another one waiting to go. If you all would pray about the logistics of getting it there. It's, it's not an easy thing. Yeah, it's in Detroit. Not an easy thing to ship that's thousands of miles. There's a lot involved. Our missionary friend, Dan Greens, who's a third generation missionary who serves in Kinshasa, is going to help us uh, he has friends, I think they're from Congo, I think they're a Congolese couple, who have a shipping business, and they're going to do it for us, but this all has to be arranged, and the generator needs to be taken to them, and then put on a boat, and shipped all the way to the port of Matadi, which is 400 miles from us, about 400 miles south of us, and then put on a train, um, a, a large semi-truck, and uh, brought up with other things. There are desperate people in Congo. The possibility of that being meddled with or stolen, uh, we can never dismiss that. So we need a lot of prayer. We have the funds to cover this, which is, praise the Lord, that we do. So it's a matter of getting it there, getting it on the boat, and getting it out to Congo. And that will serve us, we, we pray, for at least another 17 years like this one has. Um, I, I am so grateful that you all have been in the Brown family, in particular in the Collins. Um, well, I would say the Brown family, because we met Collins in the early 90s. Uh, have been in on this ministry since the beginning. And I remember going house to house with John many a time in, Detroit, in the Detroit area. We feel so blessed to be here. We feel so loved by this church. And um, your words today are very stirring. John and Deb and Paul and Doug. Uh, we don't even know how much, um, how much the Lord has in store for us. And won't it be great to be reuni reunited with all those who've gone before and, and get all caught up. But I, I did want to encourage your hearts that um, God sees your prayer, He hears your prayer, and He's very moved by your prayer. Please keep praying for us. Thank you so much. And Jim, tell us how many people that radio station reaches. That radio station covers a, a group of about 9 million. 
Whoa, nice. nine million people. Wow. So throughout the Bandundu area, uh, they get to hear it. And they even hear it all the way to Kinshasa, providing they get up at 4 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> and uh, they, the local uh, radio stations are not uh, uh, speaking. And then they, we've even heard that it reaches down to Angola, the northern part of Angola. So, but most of all, in our Bandundu uh, area. So, yeah, about nine million people that will be listening to the radio station. Your prayers uh, for that station are so important because how has it kept going? How has it kept going? Mm -hmm. And. Uh, it, it has stopped a couple times, but uh, then the Lord sends somebody, and locally sends somebody who comes and fixes that uh, diesel engine, and uh, there goes the engine again, the, the radio station again, it's, uh, it's working. So that's, uh, that's where we, uh, we stand. And uh, we want to thank the Lord for the radio station because it uh, is reaching so many, but uh, it is the word of God yeah. going out, and uh, no one can stop it. Yes, there it goes, <coughs> and it's reaching people and uh, ministering to 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 them. Well, what can we say? I see Donna and Jim yes. in the back there. They were in Congo with us a couple of times, and uh, we uh, certainly enjoyed having them there. And uh, Donna had to cook for a whole bunch of, of missionaries, and uh, there were many of them that came. And some of the, the missionaries were are the pastors. Uh, we had a pastor that was with us, and uh, he was told to eat the African food. Well, he saw that there were caterpillars, and uh, there were luku, and uh, saka saka. Sounds great. And, yeah, that's right. <laughs> all, all kinds of, uh, some of those things. And he just did not want to touch it. And we told him, if you don't eat it, you will offend the lady yes. very much that cooks. Oh, so. He decided that he, he, would, he would give it a little, little try. So we gave him a good caterpillar and, uh, <laughs> and uh, luku, luku too. So, and by the way, I have caterpillars in the refrigerator of our house in, in Tennessee. So once in a great while, uh, when we're in a church, uh, we'll offer them to, and especially with young people. And I remember, <laughs> We said one church, young people, how many, are there any of you here that would eat these caterpillars? And uh, uh, one lady, a young lady raised her hand and she said, I will. And we said, okay, you have to get permission from your, your parents. And then tomorrow we'll, she said, if they say yes, We'll give you a caterpillar to two weeks. She, she came back the, the next day and said, you want what, that caterpillar? She said, yeah, I'd like to try it. So she did. She got it and ate it up and finished the caterpillar. I ate one before, so she knew that uh, it wouldn't kill you. It would be all right. So that, uh, that we have done. Oh my, what can we say? The ministry in Congo, the people who have come to Christ, and the, the, the hundreds, and, uh, I'd like to say the thousands. We, we just don't know for sure but we're, we think that it's going to be way, way, way up there. And uh, people who, uh, who have heard it uh, on the radio station, and, said yes to Jesus Christ. But then we get to go into those villages and uh, to uh, call on them and those who have accepted the Lord through the radio station. And there are many, many people, many people. Well, we 
fun to praise the Lord for the different means of reaching them, not only through the radio, but also through evangelism. And uh, we're very much involved in that, where we go out with the big truck, the big army truck. And uh, wow, what, a, what an experience that is. Here comes the big army. It's in the uh, diesel uh, Mercedes. Uh, World War II uh, trucks that were, were, some of them were used literally in the war. And uh, so we load them up with the students and they start singing. And what can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. I can make me whole again. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Yes. And you hear that being sung in the Kituba language, sung in the Kianji language, and then in Lingala. Lingala is the national language. I, French would be the legal language. And uh, the uh, national language is uh, Lingala. And then the people speak their own languages, Kianji, Kimunda. And uh, uh, then there's the trade language, which is the one we speak. And that's uh, the uh, uh, Kituba, Kituba language. Uh, so, uh, you learn that when, you're, when you first arrive in Congo and the children are the ones who pick it up first and uh, they'll start speaking the Kituba language in about uh, uh, three months. And <laughs> my uncle, it took him two terms, two terms to finally learn the language. But uh, then he, uh, he learned it, and uh, the, uh, he spoke it so well, so well it sounded almost like an Africa. And the missionaries who had learned it faster, theirs was not as good as his. His was excellent, excellent to it. And uh, of course, I, I was brought up uh, in that language, my brother Jack and I, and uh, we uh, learned it uh, from childhood, and we speak that all of the time. Nancy speaks it. She didn't at first, but it took her about two years, and uh, then she began to speak it. Is that right? It was two yeah. years? Mm -hmm. About two years. And so now she speaks it just like anybody else speaks it. And, they, and she has it learned also in So we're thankful to the Lord for all that he has done. I just want to say Jim had a stroke in November and to hear him talk like this after what seven months is just amazing. But there are some times <laughs> there are some times when things get jumbled up and he has a, a he has to take a minute for recall. Are you wanting to tell them what big horrible mistake I made when I was learning the language? Is that why why you're hesitating? <laughs> I'm not sure. Go ahead and tell them. <laughs> okay, so he loves telling this story. Oh, I think I remember. You, remember? you tell him. It. It'll be better if you tell him. Well, not, not quite. Uh, so, yeah, the clothes lines. Um, so I was, we were there probably, I was expecting Jack. It's no fun to be pregnant in Congo, let me tell you that. And so all these hormones are very, very active. I was very sad and going through culture shock because we were the only missionaries on the station. I didn't know how I was going to have a baby in the bush. The nearest hospital was 60 miles away. Oh my was homeschooling our children, and I just didn't get the language. I was tongue-tied. So I was so proud of myself when I thought I was telling, you know, you have a lot of help there. You can't run to the water source, do evangelism, provide your own food, and do all the cooking, 
and everything that you have to do around the house, do the, you know, educate the children, and and minister to the people. So you have a lot of people who come and say, can I help you? Will you give me a little money for going and getting your water, for starting the wood stove in the morning, for going and finding wood to put in the wood stove? I mean, they're just, it's like living on a little house in the prairie. And so I was so proud of myself when I thought I was saying, will you please take the clothes off the line? <laughs> so that's something like, Katula Bileli, okay? And what, in fact, I was saying was... Take off your clothes. Take off your clothes. <laughs> <laughs> and he let me do this because he thought it was hilarious. It, just, it, it was just so funny to him. I don't know how many times I said that, and they would not correct me because they felt that would offend me. So, yeah, that was one of our early experiences. Well, and, and so the Africans came up and she said, they said, uh, can you ask your wife not to tell us to take our clothes off? <laughs> <laughs> so, I, I did. And, uh, yeah, take the clothes off the line. Katula, put that in the Mchinga. Yeah. Okay, so Mchinga. Mchinga is the big word there. And uh, she was... Uh, Katula, be a lily. If you just say that, it means take your clothes off. Well, anyway, so she, they, they didn't, and uh, she, she did well. Uh, learned the language, uh, spoke and preached, ministered to the people. So she was in the Bible school, uh, teaching the students. Oh, yes. Well, you eat them caterpillars raw? Yes. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> I always said <laughs> raw. <laughs> we eat them raw. <laughs> Not just the chocolate or anything. Yeah. Dry, dry, but, dry but, uh, but raw. Yeah. Any salt? Yeah. Salt or yeah. mayonnaise? Yeah, we do salt. You yeah. use a little bit of salt. Yeah. Yes. Maybe they have questions. Do you have any questions to ask? Uh, huh? Or not there? Well, we have a resident entomologist here. Do you need help with the caterpillars? <laughs> Mr. Jednick. Is that right? I'll tell you which ones are probably best. Yeah. <laughs> well, they are good. They are good. Uh, we have uh, no trouble uh, eating them. The Africans have no trouble eating them. I'll never look at butterflies and moths the same way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So what is the schedule or what are the issues as far as uh, getting back there? I know you wanted to get there in uh, July uh, and it didn't happen. What, what's the... Uh, uh, it's because of uh, the uh, COVID. COVID, yes, and the new strain of it. Yeah. And uh, we, what we were going to do, go to Kinshasa and then bring the staff into the capital city. We would not go to the uh, interior. Uh, but uh, if they came to the capital city, they could possibly get. Uh, the disease there, and so we, we didn't want to do that. We didn't want to have our staff uh, come down to the, the and, and has there been an issue with your people there with the COVID? Amazingly enough, nobody in our area has contracted COVID. Praise it's Lord. a miracle. We purchased our tickets early on to get the best rate we could. And then in May, there was an upsurge of COVID. And then after that, the, the Delta variant landed in Kinshasa. So there are 12 million people in Kinshasa. And they don't know, um, they don't know what space is. They don't, they don't, there's no su such thing as my personal space with them. They live together. They do life together in community, and they may have 20 people under one roof. 
So there's this constant exposure to COVID. And they're poor people. And many times you, they have to decide, should I, buy a bar, should I buy a bar of soap? Or should I buy a can of sardines to feed my family? Mm. And so hygiene is just many times not affordable. It's not that they're ignorant or they don't want to be clean, but if it came to feeding their children or having clean hands, they would, of course, choose to feed their children. Yeah. And while you are there, I mean, while you're here, Who's running the ministry, and is the college still going? Okay, Pastor Boma is heading up uh, the, uh, the ministry, and uh, he's doing an excellent job. And the people respect him because he's honest. He's one of the few that uh, we can put, give a job to do, and he'll see that it's done, completed. Uh, he will uh, funds that we send out there. Hundred percent of it is used for the. He won't touch it. He won't touch it. And is the Levan Institute continuing? Yes, is Levan continuing? It certainly is. Yes. Yeah. yeah, we just graduated a class in July, and there'll be a brand new class in October. Yeah. Yeah. My question is about the children. Uh, you've been there years. If you watch them progress and grow, are they starting to teach as well? Well, the ones who, the reason our verse, our um, our theme verse was 2 Timothy 2.2. 2. And you, you, you learn these things and then you entrust them into the hands of other people. That's the whole motive of the Bible Institute. So we get these young men and women who come from all over and then they go back and teach their own people. Yeah. Yes. And then we have uh, the reunions, and uh, we try to have them at least every two years, and you'll have 500 students who have graduated from the school. They'll come back, and uh, they get uh, energized all over again. You know? They're just thrilled to be a part of it. Any other year? So how, how many hours are these students on campus? They come and live. So they come around October 10th. They live in the dormitory. They eat all their meals there. Uh, we have people who give money so they can buy food. And then we have to pay the professors. And Pastor Isaac is the academic dean. He loves the students like his own children. He's a man in his 50s. And they stay there till December, around December 15th, they go home for Christmas, come back in January and stay till just before Easter, go home for Easter, come back and stay till July, and then they go home for the summer. So, so, so how, how many hours are each pass on campus? Well, the, the training is 90 hours of study, if that answers your question. They, yeah. have, they have 90 school credits that they have to fulfill before they graduate. Wow. So they beautiful that they go over and they spread it after you teach them. I think that's wonderful. Yeah. yeah, and they don't get paid anything. It's it's a very hard life. Tithing is not a big thing in Congo because they have so little, this is what they want to do with it. They grasp it in their hands. But books like Malachi have really helped. And, and there, there, is, there are churches where people do tithe. But it's, it's slow catching on when you only earn $700 a year. For them to give up $70, those who have done that always see God return it. Yes. But those who haven't are missing out on the yes. joy of trusting Him. Yes. If they can get to that point where they realize God is no debtor, and he will, he will absolutely take care of you. Then they they go on to greater heights of trust. But it's it's a difficult principle to get across. I, I think it's difficult in America, right, John? Not everybody in the church ties. Yes. 
Not, not, I don't even know if 20% tithe in the average church. And in America, they say the average giving, even within the church, is about 2 to 3%. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So you can understand why they, they, there's no welfare there. They can't go and get help for each child they have. There's no, there's no way to take care of the elderly. So they end up with the responsibility of their clan. Yeah. And if you run into a little bit of money, then the relatives come and stay with you. Mm -hmm. and, uh, Uninvited. <laughs> and you don't necessarily want them there, you know, but uh, they're there anyway. And, and it can be vicious. Mm. They can be vicious. They can be killed. Mm. The, the person with the money can actually uh, come up uh, missing uh, because uh, he has money, but he won't share it with his brother. But he doesn't have that much to share. Well, it's quite a, it's quite a ordeal. Yes. How many children do you have, and are they involved with evangelizing and the mysteries and stuff? We have four children. They're all much older now. Yeah. <laughs> they all have families of their own, but many of them uh, are involved prayer-wise, financially, emotionally, and help promote the ministry. Yeah. And Jack has, and Molly have started a church in... Uh, He's our youngest, Jack. Mount Pleasant, Mount Pleasant, Columbia, Columbia, Columbia. Yeah. and uh, then uh, uh, Sean is, uh, he is a Bible study uh, writer, writer. Wow. and she has also written a book on the Congo, it's called Congo and Yet, and it gives, tells the different stories that happen to us, maybe some of you have already read it. Yeah, we got Yeah. So uh, uh, then let me see. We have uh, well, Nicole, and she's with her husband in Maine, and he's pastoring the church there. And uh, then Todd, Todd, who knows where he might be? He he could be uh, in Idaho right now and uh, singing. And uh, ministering that uh, to, to people here in this country. Now Jack will be going back with us to the Congo and uh, help us with the work out there, and then he'll come back. So he has the church here and uh, the church, and what else? The and he and Molly started a school. Our daughter-in-law started a school because they have an autistic child. And uh, children can be very cruel, especially when you aren't like them. They can't, they know something's different. And Jackson is definitely, he, he goes by a different drumbeat. Uh, they haven't diagnosed him, but they know something, he's on the, he's on the spectrum somewhere. So they were punching him in school, he was attending a public school. They were saying vulgarities to him, very unkind words, and giving hours and hours of homework. And so Jack and Molly were like, we'll just start our own school. Sure. So they go three days a week. and Three days a week. We can talk about that more over lunch. But I was going to say, the other reason we didn't go, John, this is a big prayer request, is because of the few missionaries who remain in the bush, there's no demand for the airplane service we used to have. We could get a seat on a plane from Kinshasa to go to our station, which is hundreds of miles in what they call the interior, uh, for $250. We used to be able to do that one way. But they, do, they don't fly anymore. So the only way you can go now is to charter the plane, and it's twenty-five hundred dollars. One, you know, one $250 charter to twenty-five hundred. So ten times as much. It costs as much to go 
from Kinshasa to our station as it does from Kinshasa to the United States. Oh, wow. So last year when we went, at the last minute, the Lord worked out, the last minute to us, he worked out um, Bill Gates' Bill Gates's plane. Ah. Bill Gates had sent a team to do research on malaria. He does this frequently. And so someone inquired for us, another missionary friend in Kinshasa, and said, is there any way the Smiths can get a seat on that plane? And things turned out so that we did. Uh, but to go back from the interior to Kinshasa, you can't drive. It's 15 to 24 hours. The roads are terrible. There are barriers. And there are bandits on the road. So the best way is to take the plane. Well, that's another 2500 So we have to pay one charter. But if there were a way we could be guaranteed a seat there, to go up for, for the other way, we would schedule our trip around that. It's just that there are, there are none available right now. I'd like to say this too, that uh, we sent out the, a letter simply stating that we need motorcycles and that we needed three motorcycles and uh, one for uh, uh, Pastor Boma one for uh, Gunga, and one for Isaac. And uh, so, lo and behold, here the money came in. And uh, we were able to get uh, a brand new, brand new wow. motorcycle for each one, one of them. Uh, probably a couple more that we're going to be needing, but uh, yeah, we thank, thank the Lord. That we're yes. Any other Donna. Oh, Donna. <laughs> I was going to say when you were talking about Todd, you just mentioned that that was the group Salem's. Some of them might know of that. Problem. Yes. Yes. Oh boy, that's a major mistake. Are you? Have you ever heard of the group called Salem? I know he's on uh, several of us. WMUZ. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. Yeah. Several. Several stations. But uh, they, they're doing. Uh, they were. It was very difficult uh, for them during COVID, but uh, it's beginning to come back now. And, uh, but they've been singing and praising the Lord, and it's just been wonderful. Todd is the lead singer in Salem. Yes, they've won the double award on numerous occasions. Yes, yes, <laughs> yes. and including this year. Yeah. And they came to this very church. They did. And they played here. They did. And they sang to us. Yeah. And Tony would be interested in that because he, he and Paul run a, a coffee house. Oh, oh okay. Okay. Yeah, that was and many years And we probably get more than ago. usual, uh, Tony. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and I, I think the piano was a little... It was, it was small. Oh. It was small. Yeah, yeah because it. I remember uh, the... What's the gentleman saying? Alan. He's still with them? Yeah. Yeah, he was saying, yeah, he said, I don't know, we didn't have enough octaves on there. Uh -huh. And I think you were here one time because you played piano. You said, yeah, 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 yeah. I can't quite, uh, you know, we're, we're missing a couple of octaves <laughs> here. But this one is uh, beautiful. <laughs> and we'd like to say, this is so important. So many people are coming to Christ. Yes. Through the evangelism, through the ministry, yes. to realize that that Bible school is teaching the Word of God and uh, so that the students can take it back to their villages and uh, then come back and, and uh, learn some more and more. But evangelism, even, I, I can't tell you how many have uh, come to Christ uh, even in this, uh, this year. Amen. Yeah, we had, I'm sorry? That's by God's grace. Yeah, by God's grace. Yeah. In May, one of the graduates uh, died. His name was Pastor Kisiam. Mm -hmm. And he he came, he ministered in the village of Mbila. Mbila was one of the largest schools, locations for a women's literacy school that we've ever had. There were about 80 women. We went to them because it's seven miles away. It's too hard for them to walk. So we took the car and went to them three times a week. 
and things just caught on fire at Avila. You know, there, more is caught than is taught. And they just, they caught on to the gospel, to the word of God, to evangelism. And so it, it changed the face of the village. Well, he pastored there for many years, Pastor Casino. And he um, died in May. And the village has opened our team many, many times to come and minister. They've heard the gospel. So you won't see a lot of hands go up because people know the Lord there. But when he died, a lot came from other villages because they loved him and they knew him. And they're very open. When someone dies in Congo, they will release all their emotion, which is very healthy. And they'll cry and they'll scream and they'll express, they'll, they'll lament. The Bible uses that word and tells us to lament for our sins. Well, they lament for their dead loved ones. Yes. And many, I think there were maybe 90 people who responded to the gospel because they came all the way to the village and went through the, the memorial, the funeral, all of the cultural, um, culturally involved acts of participating in a, in a funeral in Congo. John, I don't know how much time we have. It's 20 to 1. We're, we're concerned right now. Okay. Okay. So any other questions? Oh. Oh, I wanted to leave another verse with y'all. And times are hard, right? Yes, yes it is. Times are uncertain. Yes. But the Bible is so relevant. So this, these verses are in Habakkuk. One time years ago, I think we were at Warndale, John. Yes. And Pastor Armstrong was preaching. And he said, uh, you know, you better know your Bibles. Because when you get to heaven and a person like Habakkuk <laughs> comes up to you, who we don't really read every day, right? right. And he says, hey, how'd you enjoy my book? <laughs> what are you going to say to him? So these verses are found in Habakkuk. It's a wonderful little book, just three chapters, and it describes our time. And this is our prayer, that we will remain thankful, grateful, and faithful to the end. And I'm starting in chapter 3, verse 17. Again, it's the Amplified. Though the fig tree does not blossom, and there's no fruit on the vines, though the product of the olive fails, and the fields yield no food, though the flock is cut off from the fold, and there are no cattle in the stalls, what should our response be? Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will exalt in the victorious God of my salvation. The Lord is my strength, my personal bravery. Don't you love that? Isn't that a beautiful description? And my invincible army. He makes my feet like hind's feet. You know, hind's feet had this little gelatinous, oh dear, gelatinous um, substance on their feet. So when they climb rocks and mountains, it serves as a suction point, pulls their feet right in. He makes my feet like hind's feet and will make me to walk, not stand still in terror. We don't want to stand still in terror. But to walk and make spiritual progress upon my high places of trouble, suffering, or responsibility. Amen? Amen. 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 And do you still remember that song?